That's the power of the canvas of life, people. Oh my gosh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> So we're at episode 10 of the COVID specials. We usually talk about the events happening around this pandemic situation. But in this last week, there's only been one topic which we have to talk about. On May the 25th in Minneapolis, Minnesota, an innocent black man was killed by police officers. The police officer knelt on his neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, causing him to die of a lack of blood flow to his brain and restricted breathing. His death is not a rare occurrence. Many black women and men have lost their lives due to police brutality. Eric Garner, Sandra Bland and Brianna Taylor to name a few. This man's death has led to protests and campaigns all over the world, including France, Germany and the UK in addition to all 50 states in the US. These protests have occurred after decades, if not centuries, of injustice to black people. His death has caused a revolution. Remember his name. His name is George Floyd. Now, we couldn't have just discussed this amongst ourselves, so we've invited our good friend Kez to help us discuss this issue. I'm just completely like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm in a complete... I'm completely, I feel like I'm still in shock by the world and everything that's going on and pushed, like, my anger has been pushed to the point where, like, I'm just so ready to just not hold back on anything and do everything that I can to just dismantle white supremacy and just make everyone understand what has been going on, like, forever. Do you know what I mean? That's how I'm kind of feeling. I I just feel a bit hyped up. I don't even know what to. It's, I think it's just been an overwhelming last few days. It has. And some of the reactions from people has been both encouraging and deflating at the same time. I've had some conversations with people where it's been very encouraging and people are willing to want to understand what it exactly it is that we go through. Whereas then I read some comments from people who are literally like, they just don't, they don't want to learn. They don't want to know. To them, what they know is, is fact. And that's, that's the gospel. They don't want to know any different. And that's quite deflating because it's kind of like, how are things going to change if people aren't even willing to to hear you out? hundred percent. But it's like, I feel like everything that's happening right now, I've been trying, I've been having conversations with very difficult conversations with white people about race for a very long time. And it's always deflating and feels like shit until you, until you see like, you see that you've got through to them in some way. And I've been in situations where that's happened and I can see that I've made someone just understand a little bit better that like you have a privilege that you that you can't even see a lot of the time. And seeing what happened to George Floyd has absolutely shattered my heart. I know you're not feeling the same. And that's because you're white. And that's and and that's the the problem your outrage is just not there like yeah you might have been upset you might even shed a couple of tears whatever but that's the problem like you it's you need to be like people need to be ready and aware and uncomfortable around the fact that this happens all the time and we're telling them that now they've seen it and now it's become like a social media storm and it's almost trendy to post about black lives do you know what I mean? This is, it's just not good enough. Like, and and this momentum needs to be kept. And I'm so ready to keep it in everyone's faces. I'm so ready for that. Definitely. I just hope the conversation, I just hope it's not like another social media trend. You know how we we had the beginning of lockdown and there were all these different trends and all these different things. I just hope this isn't something that's going to last a couple of weeks. But that's how it is with, with, with whiteness. That's how it is. Everything's a trend. And everything with blackness is a trend to white people unfortunately do you know what I mean like the client like everything that's how the world is working but I feel like we have a unique opportunity at the moment to make people actually see the inhumanity of themselves of the of the institutions that are meant to protect us like it's everyone has everyone feels shamed into like considering and thinking about all the things that they've done in the past that's helped maintain systems of oppression and white supremacy and all this stuff like it's just it's a really weird feeling but it's also terrifying because like you know the place America where like all of this shit is going down the worst or like you know where the spotlight is on is being run by a dictator so it's just yeah, that's a that's an interesting point actually. 
if the person who's who's running the country and the people who are running the country are acting like the way he is and saying they're gonna like for example i'm gonna part the military to control these protesters even though it's their right to protest like that actually is in their amendment and so for him to say that it's almost like what was going on you know it that's the thing of course yes of course yes but the fact that the fact that um police have been getting away with killing black people is an, it's obviously murder and is a crime and they're not in prison. There is, America is lawless and nobody can say that it isn't. It's a completely lawless country. The leader of the country has shown absolute no hint of listening to the people who are protesting. He's quite aware on so many separate occasions, whereas on so many separate occasions, he's he's been very vocal. For example, the protests three or so weeks ago where which came from people asking for um freedom to to do whatever with business and so uh, etc during the COVID, coronavirus situation and he was very vocal in in their uh in their, These on are their good side. people yeah that's exactly what you said but when it's black people they're thugs yeah so his ignorance has been so blatant and i it, yeah like what do you do well what is so terrifying about america is that it's like those people we are in a fucking pandemic. We're all confined. We can't, it, no one can get out of the country that they're stuck in. It's terrifying. If I was over there, I would be so terrified by, it's just, yeah, it's that's, it's so scary. It's so scary. I, I saw a, um, a tweet today where an American footballer basically said that his granddad said he was glad he was, in, he was not in the country because as a young black man, he would be worried about him right now. And it just shows you that it's as if I'm a young black man, so so this that so so this touches me a lot because I can't because I'm for example I don't think of how I move right. I'm someone who likes to walk anywhere, and I I literally go into different areas and different. I I just go for walks, right? Just to and I feel like if I lived in America and I lived in these areas, imagine someone just mis- like thought I was a burglar or I was I was something just because I'm black. And I can't, so that means I can't just walk anywhere and have the freedom to just do anything because of the colour of my skin and someone's going to mistake me. And the chances are so high of that happening. So high. I mean, we've all seen Amy Cooper call the police on a bird watcher. You can hear from that man's voice he's a nerd. Like, he's not attacking you. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? That man's watching birds. And you're literally (laughs) hysterically strangling your dog. But do, do you know what? I feel like there was more sympathy for the dog done for done for um oh a hundred percent but what i think is so amazing what amazes me is that you can be so hysterical in such panic under not when you're receiving no threats whatsoever that you're on the phone to the police telling them that you're being your life's being threatened whilst you're literally hanging an animal like how that is what is so interesting to me about the problem of whiteness and and what that says, like your hysteria, what where's that coming from? Also, talk, thinking about the fact that you 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 can see in that woman's eyes, and like that, like what Trevor Noah said in that video he posted, like you can see in that woman's eyes that she, and what in what she's saying, she's like, I there's a black or like African American man threatening my life. I need the police. You can. She knows what could happen to that man. And that that one woman that was recorded, if anything we can learn about any of this, is that there was two situations that happen every day, everywhere, that were recorded. And we tell people that this kind of thing happens all the time. And it was just caught on camera. That is the only reason this is happening. The world's gone wild. And do you know what is crazy about this? Or that what's been happening? It's because when you when you actually deep it, so for me that that Amy Cooper situation, I know some people might think it's not that big a deal because nothing bad like came out of it. But people need to realize that probably hundreds of years, right? This situation has been happening to people. Like I bring you the case of Emmett Till, right? A fourteen year old boy who was killed because of a white another white woman claiming that he whistled at her, right? This person lost his life. Imagine that. So there was no cameras in the in the nineteen sixties or when it, when it was, right? This fourteen-year-old boy, fourteen-year-old boy, that's that's a young, a young, that's a child, right? Lost his life because of so when I, so when these kind of things have been happening for decades and white women saying I'm under threat by a and it, because 
they also not only is it that they say that they're terrified of us even from children you're not allowed to be a child because you're it's called adulterism that's a whole that's a whole yeah that's a whole different it happens to um black girls as well where they get seen a lot older than they are you're sexualized so much younger yes and it's scary and you don't understand it like i watched a video last week where a police officer was literally beating up a 14 year old boy and my first my first thought was if he if he's a father and someone was a grown man a very large man by the way not not just like like a very large man was beating his 14 year old Mm -hmm. son like that how would he feel so how dare you do that to another man's son a 14 year old boy and i looked at it and i thought i was disgusted but what is so this is a point that is so scary is that in 2020 there are still so many white people that can't even see us as humans they don't see it they don't see a child they like they no there's no debating that what happened to George Floyd was cold-blooded murder in daylight but it's still being debated as if it's there's right or wrong or like there's still like that's the thing like that is the problem. I know, I, like, we all know what that feels like to, it's like you're not seen. And it's almost, it's just, yeah, it's just, it, that's what it is. It's like you're not seen. I think it's, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why um, they just don't see black people as fellow humans. And this has been happening for years where they, like, even in, in like, in health, where they don't, they think we can, and like we can hold pain a lot like they, i don't know what they think what what they're so sort of threatened about our bodies that they think yeah, like they think we can that we can absorb more pain yeah, it's higher than a white than, than, than a white person um they just use like some some of the stories i've read about things that happened in slavery it's just like and be, like and all these experiments that they've done on black people and and also it's almost like they don't treat us like humans because you wouldn't do that to a fellow human being because if you did, you would. If you if they talk to us as fellow human beings, they wouldn't do all these kind of things. So, if you think if a couple of hundred years ago, black people were being sold like cargo, so that that you can't say like when people say like oh don't like bring everything back to slavery doesn't not everything it most of this shit comes back to fucking slavery because like Jace like what you were saying yesterday you are from Ghana right and when you were there. No one is talking about you being black because you're just a fucking human being. But when you're in England or you're in the US, you are... The first thing you identify is, a, is as a black person. Whereas, like, and like, like, like I said to you the other day, um, before, when I first came to this country, I never thought myself. I never thought of myself as a black person until I came here. And then all of a sudden, being the, <laughs> the colour of your skin plays such a huge role in the rest of your life. Whereas before... Like everything you do, it's it's either based on kind of like how you behave, um, how you do in school, all that kind of stuff. Things that define you as a person, right? Whereas, yeah, things your interest, things things you're into, things you're not into, blah blah blah, all that kind of stuff. And then you come here, and the first thing you notice is that there's the color of your skin plays a part. You notice that you notice you notice other black people. You notice like you notice that there's a difference between you and your white friends even uh, even from a young age where it's just it plays such a huge role so when people so it's not like it's not that people don't want to talk about race or want to talk about race it's it's just because we make it we've been made it's become such a huge part of our lives it's the first thing people see when they when they um when they see us it's not oh this is my this is what am i trying to say this is this isn't like I'm a black person. Basically, my first, so my first identity in this country is a black, is a black man. Yeah, yeah. And then everything else comes secondary to that. Exactly. And as soon as, like, I remember trying to explain this to friends years ago. Like, the word black has got. So for me, growing up mixed race, but only with my white family, going to live in an incredibly white area, completely surrounded by whiteness. Like that word, because I. I knew everyone that I grew up with had racist, that they were racist. The word black had so much negative connotations. Do you know what I mean? It's just that you, people would say the word black, not just as your identifier, but to 
I don't know, to show that a situation was dangerous or black, bad, like, oh, yeah, he was a black man. Do you know what I mean? It's like, as black people, we're completely stripped of our identity. It just can't, I think we they just see us as different. I think, I think it, there's this animalistic view that they have of us, right, which is not acknowledged because even in sports, you see it. So growing up, the, the black kid is always the fast kid. <laughs> Whether he's fast or not, people assume he's fast. Right. It's like, why aren't you, if you, and if you're black and you can't, and you can't run, run, it's like, what's wrong yeah, with exactly. you? Exactly, then you're not really black or whatever. Yeah, or you can't dance, or you can't sing. Exactly, all those kind of things. So, you... so on that note, guys, um, so obviously from, from my point of view, like having grown up and born in the UK, my background being Bangladeshi, so yeah, like you, Jace, I mean, having grown up, I... I probably right up to the age of let's say six i genuinely did not think of what like a single thought about my skin color or anything it's only until things like 9 11 that happened you then you start noticing I, I actually remember like the day after we went into school and it just felt like everyone was talking about it and it's just like that's the first time i would have felt outside of a in, like the included circle it was just like whoa geez that's when it's like having that that moment of clearance so you're like whoa everyone looks you different it's like you yeah everything just starts moving far away from you and then as you're growing up you think of it you try and think of it less and then more things happen more events happen um and then that's around what i think there was a london bombings that happened when i was 10 um in 2005 and then growing up even more there was a lot uh, loads more inc- incidents is happening and then by that time the internet was a thing facebook was a thing then you grow up and you see all the comments and whatnot and you're just like whoa people really must hate me or whatever um yeah so that that was my journey from a, a, a the point of view from another ethnic um background as in like the fact that at a young age you don't see it but then you um you're open to it when so many big events happen and that's when people become a lot more vocal f- from um the opposite side yeah britain is so racist and like it's obviously we all know that from our different perspectives whether we've got do you know what i mean like and it's funny right you say that because i remember a joke yeah, where someone said that muslims are like the new black people right which shows you that people know that these things happen but we want to pretend that nothing like there's no racial um hatred towards a group so the fact that someone actually could make that joke that oh, like um, Muslims are the new black people shows you that you know that black people haven't cheated badly, and now Muslims are being treated. Doesn't badly. that also show you that whoever made that joke is so normalised to it that they don't see exactly. it as a bad thing? That exactly. it's just instilled. I mean, I've had so many arguments with people about the fact that, like, yeah, do you know what? I um, I consider myself a funny person. I can take a joke, but it's the whole argument and concepts about people being able to um maintain the right to say whatever they want because free speech and ridiculously racist jokes are okay because they're a joke do you know what i mean i was i was in an argument with some guy recently because he didn't think that you, like you should be able to say whatever you want and that like comedy is art isn't it so why shouldn't i be able to say whatever i want it's because you're upholding negative stereotypes and they're not affecting you because you're white like most people most white people um probably wouldn't in, in not many places would they feel like a minority or would they or would they feel um, like their race is being called into question exactly. it's never happened to them before this is the, this is like the first couple couple of years it's probably the first time in some of people's lives where they've been realized that oh wait i'm a i'm a white person you know whereas for many of us it's like right he said it was when 9-11 happened and then you start to realize that oh wait you know what people are looking at me different now where, and for maybe someone like me and you, it would be also be around similar times when we realise that, oh, wait, you know what? I'm a black man or I'm a mixed rate. I'm a, well, I'm not a black man when I was young, but, you know, I was a black boy. <laughs> um, or you're a mixed race girl at that age. Do you know what I mean? Like, you start to notice these things quite early. Whereas for most white people, they'll probably go their lives not realising that they are white because white is known as, is, to some people, white is default. So white is the original. White is, is it doesn't play, a, it doesn't play a role in your, in your life they never have to think about their race exactly exactly that and that is such a thing because for like for us it's like it just is it's it takes it chases us everywhere not that like as much as you can own it and become comfortable with who you are you are still faced with the injustice 
of being more likely to be killed by the police, being more likely to die in hospital. Your baby is more likely to die if you have a baby. You're more likely to get, you're going to get followed around shops. You Do you know what I mean? Like, And I think people sometimes They think, don't have to think about that. Yeah. And I think a lot of people probably wouldn't, like there's not many places a white person will go to where they stand out, right? Um, whether, I mean, it, of, of course it can happen because you can't go to some places where you are. I, actually, it's funny because when I was in uni one, one time, um, one of, someone that I knew, I'm not going to bait his name out, but he said something to me and my friend, right, where it literally, we literally talked about it after. We're like, whoa. So basically, we invited him to something, right? And it was predominantly black people. So it was mostly white people, um, black people. So he was going to be the only white person there. And we 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 invited him if he wanted to if he wanted to come along, and he said nah. He said something along the lines of nah. Um, he'd feel awkward because he'd be the only white person there. I was like, I was like, oh my days. So this one event that you're gonna yeah, that you're gonna yeah that you that you're gonna be the only person who looks like yourself, you're uncomfortable about it. But a lot of us will probably go most of our lives being in spaces where there's no one else that looks like us. Or there's very few that look like us, but we just have to carry on life normal because we don't we have, we have no other choice. I can't say I can't just say I'm, I want to be where all the black people are because then I can't do what I do because in what I do there's a very there's a small percentage of black people who do what I do, you know. So I'd have to change completely change my career or do something where it's mostly black people, and obviously that can't run because how how are you going to make change if you run away from these kind of situations? And so for me, when 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 he said that, when he said that, I was just I was shocked, and I just thought, whoa, okay, fair enough. So you do realize that a lot of us. So I, that's just for me, because sometimes I think people can be they can they choose when they see things and when they don't see things because they can make jokes about some of these injustice, they can make comments about these kind of things, but then when it comes to dealing with an issue, it's I don't see color. But clearly you do because you made a joke about it before or you've made a comment about another situation which relates to it. And it's kind of like, pick where you stand. Don't 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 pick and choose what fits you at that moment in time. And for me, that's what I don't like. The whole I don't see colour argument is, is infuriating because it's like, I want you to see... Obviously, I know there's no way you don't see colour because that's the most ridiculous comment I've ever heard in my life. I mean, I don't know of any colour blindness where people don't see between con um <laughs> i just don't see race <laughs> yeah. i've never seen yeah, I've never heard of it, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that doesn't exist i don't think like whatever that it does not exist i'm sorry and it's funny because um like right he can right he can um add to this when so me and Rai went to the same school and we grew up basically our school was quite multicultural so there were asians polish blacks whites and race never actually ever played a part really where i think everyone like we all knew we were different colors and it was i mean different races and we mentioned it and stuff like that but it was peace like like, there was never any kind of like oh this is like i just like i don't think i don't i don't think i ever there wasn't there wasn't a segregation segregation to the point where like if you were to go to the playground you'd only see a group of asians on their own uh, refusing to interact (laughs) with a group of white or group of black people was literally everyone was do you know one thing that i really liked about school was the fact that everyone had an opportunity to to learn about each other's backgrounds i feel like towards the end of it everyone so much people knew about this and that um do you know what I mean? So like that that was one reason why when I used to go to places, when I used to first travel out to places like um to Spain or wherever, Italy, whatever, and I used to be so shocked by the fact that people knew nothing about my background or the fact that Jace, do you remember when we went once to a restaurant and uh, the guy was like, Where are you guys from? This is when we're about to go and pay, and he's like, Where are you from? And we said we're from England. He's like, No, you can't be, you're not from England. And he's like, he's, 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 he was in disbelief. Like, nah, mate, we're from England. <laughs> like, nah. He's like, No, where are you actually from, guys? Come on. Are you serious? We're like, Someone said to me in Spanish, and my friend like translated it when I was living in Madrid, like, um, because they were like, "Oh my god, your English is so good," <laughs> and they were, and they were like, "She's from England," and they, he, his face was like, "What?" Like, and I was just like, "What?" Like, you don't know that there's black people in England that could speak English and have an English accent, and he was just like, "Whoa." 
Uh, yeah, it's crazy because you go to some countries and the minute you start speaking, they're literally like, what? They just like the fact, like the fact that you have a strong English accent just doesn't make sense to them because to them, what's coming out of your mouth does not fit your face. It doesn't match up. They <laughs> yeah. just are literally just like yeah. they just go into. They, it's like it's like their brains just short circuit and they're just kind of like don't know what don't know what to say. So when I was living in Madrid, I was um, like my best friend there was South African and she was white. <laughs> so like when we were like out together and people were like, where are you from? And I'd be like, oh, I'm from England. And she'd be like, I'm from Africa. <laughs> and we were literally so just good. like, people were like, what? And we would just be like, yeah. Like kind of just not saying anything, you know, like not add to the fact that, yeah, it's a bit strange. Like it's not what you would expect, but yeah, you dumb fucks. <laughs> <laughs> like Jesus Christ. <laughs> And that's why when people say there's no race, like, oh, we don't have such a bad issue in the UK or in Europe or whatever, people forget that a lot of this. Like, I would have come, it was like um, UK, Portugal, etc., France are literally like the big brothers of racism when it comes, like, they're the big, like, America's big brother when it comes to racism because they basically, like, America basically got it from them. Oh yes, we've all come from the UK, haven't we? Like, that's where the Australians are. That's what, do you know what I mean? That's who the Australians are. That's who the British are, and um, who the Americans are. It's all come from us. And it's like I could, I, they, people forget. They, I told, so I put on my Instagram post earlier when I was like, I for one could tell people many stories about like situations, whether it's kind of like subtle or it's blatantly in your face of situations yeah like you know I mean? like we could literally have a whole just discussing different situations that have happened to all three of us but how many times have you been in a situation when you said it with a white person you've gone oh, like you're like in a situation where they're kind of denying the fact that racism exists and they literally expect you to pull out all the times like okay so this time someone called me the m-word and this time someone did you know what i mean this time it's like and then even then they'll still be like oh Oh, it's like, because how many examples do you want me to give you? So I got called nigger three times in like the space. Do you know what I mean? Like how many times? It's just the most frustrating thing. Like, I posted something um, about the burden of proof on black people. The burden of proof is to prove their pain, to prove that it is our colour, that the reason why we are being treated badly, to prove that um, we do receive worse treatment, to prove that we're being dehumanized, dehumanised um all of this stuff like you you, when you enter a discussion like I feel like a the book that I'm always begging people to read is Rennie Edo Lodge why I'm no longer talking to white people about race I beg people to read that book sometimes when I'm in a conversation I'm trying to turn my back on it because it's getting heated and I'm trying to stay as calm as possible because otherwise I'll be called aggressive because I'm the black one in the situation. And that's what happens when you enter in a conversation with a white person about racism. They'll get defensive and feel like they're being attacked and then cry aggression. That that book is, there's so many things that people need to read, but... Is there anything from that? Is there anything from that book that you'd like to like the main sort of points that you want to highlight? Do you know what? I read this book like years ago, and all I've done is just keep reiterating to the point that you need to read it, and the fact that, um, do you know, I can't even I can't even pull out a particular well, point. I think one point I remember from it. Sorry, there was one point that I particularly remember from it where um, they were just talking to how kind of like race affects kind of like where people are. So, like for example. Britain has needed black people many a times. So whether it's kind of like during the world wars or um, after world wars. When- what we learn from that book is black history and we don't learn that at school. That's That book was one of the first times that I actively tucked into some black history and really learned some shit because all of the stuff about racism that we learn is about slavery in the US. Do you know what I mean? I learned about Windrush and it's all of those things. But also one of the, the biggest points of that book, Rennie Edo Lodge points out the fact that as soon as you try and talk about racism to a white person, they get defensive, make it all about themselves. And then you have to end up comforting that person. And it's so insulting. And as the perpetrators of racism yourselves, you need to 
stop being defensive start being able to listen it all comes down to just like basic respect of like listening to someone's experience that you haven't had it's that simple I wouldn't express my opinions on loads of different things because I don't know what it's like to be Jewish for example so I'm not just going to go around and tell how get into an argument with someone who may have do you know what I mean like I think people they don't okay so to be like to cut them a little something right I think to them because they've never because they've never had to deal with situations where it's come into play it doesn't make sense for them because to them everyone oh this the this is the land of opportunity um if you if you work hard you can make anything of yourself and it doesn't matter where you're from or what you are blah 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 that's what that's what they believe so when that's privilege someone, isn't it exactly and that is that is that is their privilege they don't realize that first of all your where you like the color of your skin determines kind of like where which where you are and that determines what kind of opportunities you receive which means so for example um some 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 careers right have such a low um percentage of black people or more of people of different ethnicities in that role not because they aren't smart enough to do those kind of jobs or to do those kind of careers but basically because they didn't they didn't get an opportunity to 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 get to do to they didn't get opportunity to either study those kind of subjects even things like in a college book where he's talking about how teachers mark black kids down and oh my Christ. A whole, so when covid happened and they said they're going to basically base um students grades on their predicted grades a lot of black a lot of black kids were worried because black kids apparently always statist- statistically outperform their predicted grades because their teachers always predict them lower than what they actually what they can achieve so when things that are happening and you're not given opportunities because people don't think you're capable of doing it these kind of opportunities don't come to you and so people end up basically not doing roles that they were that they were supposed to do you know i've had a situation at six at six form when someone a teacher's actually given me I used to, it's like she got me and my white friend completely confused because I'd had, we, we were graded on like four topics, like homework, turning up, blah, blah, blah. And we both knew, like, it's like she'd got the grades completely switched. Like it was, it was actually, we both looked at each other and was like, what? It was madness. And that was one of the times I fucking stopped giving a shit about school because I was just, I knew like, yeah, there's injustice and there's bias in the grading system and there's bias in everything. It, it's so institutional. Kez, I was going to ask. So, because you've mentioned that, like, you were brought up in an entire, like, in the major- a majority of a white family. So, how, how, like, yeah, what was your journey like? When did you first discover? Did you ever feel out of place at any point? When, yeah, what was that like? It was as soon as I left home, like, to go to like go to school. Like, I came home. I think I must have been like. I don't know, like, I went to nursery or something, I was, like, three, and I came home, and I was saying, I was saying that my name was Katie, that I was four years old, and that I was white, that's what I was telling everyone, I was that young to know that I was different, do you know what I mean, like, it was weird, and to be honest, like, unfortunately, my family never really addressed it, because they were just, like, you're just a normal girl, like, you you're just like, you're beautiful, you're like everyone else. Like when I'd come home, just be like, someone's said this to me. Do you know what I mean? It got to the point where I just stopped telling my family. But it, they were kind of clueless to the fact that bringing up a black kid was going to be different to bringing up a white kid in a white area that and I was going to experience different kind of stuff. That's one of the issues, yeah? It's like, even if someone who wants to have a black, like, do you know what I mean? someone who is happy to have a black child and they're white you need to be actively educated because i i agree with that actually i really agree with that it will it was actually no i'm telling you it's 100 percent the case because you can't prepare that you need to be able to prepare that kid for what for what he's going to face and if i'm um, growing up in a very very white area it's like the white people i've been around have no filter they are it's, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's not an integrated, there's, it's not, um, I didn't grow up in a very multicultural society whatsoever. My first two, two schools, I was the only black kid, like literally the only one. And 
yeah, it was really, it was really, really hard. And I think the reason why I'm so passionate about raising, it fascinates me that that people that know you and love you can still have prejudice, and and that is that is a hundred percent the case. Like, and that is the problem with with a lot of people today is that they think that they might know everything or because they know a black person or they love a black person or they like they've got a taste for black men do you know what I mean like you're not actively anti-racist because of any of those things and that is what we need you to be they need to realize that like you just said right now that it's not just about not being racist it's not just about not being the one who say like you know who says the n-word or like that's not enough and like I can't just sit back and like for example, even like as a man, right? I can't just sit back and not do anything about women rights and then exp- and then say I'm for women if I'm not doing anything because you still need to either call it out or use any opportunity that you can to make a difference to actually do make the difference. And I think a lot of people think that what because they're just kind of like not actively doing the racism. It means it's okay. Oh, I'm not a racist. I I have black friends. So if you have black friends, that that even means that you should stand up even more for them because they're going to be in spaces. Like if you try, like you need to try and understand that sometimes we go into situations where when we talk passionately about what's going on, we're going to be seen as aggressive, especially as a black man or as a black woman. You're going to, like you're just going to be seen as aggressive. So maybe by you saying something people will try to understand because it's from a different point of view and it's kind of like, oh, okay, um, you know what, maybe we can understand it better. I, I don't know. I just, feel, I just feel like it's not just up to us. I think I've definitely got a privilege to be able to talk to white people on a certain level because I sound white on the phone. I know I've got that privilege. Do you know what I mean? Like I saw a meme the other day that was just like, anything is possible when you sound white on the phone. And it's just like, I've definitely turned up to situations and they've just been like, oh, do you know what I mean? So yeah, like I've definitely, I've, unfortunately I feel like being so in so such white spaces I'm exposed to so much racism and a lot of the time microaggressions or not and like every person of colour is I have I feel like I I feel like it's I have a duty to change people's perceptions and like kind of go through the difficult conversations with them because it's so yeah, yeah we kind of do but yeah we kind of do but also it's kind of like it kind of sucks it has to be us and we have to go through it and because it I've been in situations that have made things harder for me at work because I'm trying to stick up for what is right for the next kid that comes through do you know what I mean because but but that's the problem it it should be white people that because enough white people see that stuff to and that is what we're trying to ask for now isn't it yeah, we're trying to ask for people to to fucking step in. Step in now. Like Because people don't see I mean it happened I I think when people saw it in football they were disgusted. So you know when people are like calling like chucking bananas, like making monkey noises and also that footballers, people saw it and they're like, Oh, okay, this is I I think they thought it was a foot it was a it was a football problem. And I think people need to realise that that's just a reflection of what life is like and what these people these people didn't didn't happen to just be racist at football they're racist they're racist in normal in normal life and so when we're trying to tell you that we experience racism whether it's people actively saying it to our faces or it's kind of like microaggressions where they'll say little comments where it's just kind of like oh like it's not really out there but they know exactly what they're saying or they're making little jokes or there's just like not opportunities and they can and I think people realize that there's so many things that have become a product of either racism or just this whole injustice it's I, I think people forget that even stuff like like Grenfell happening and all this kind of, that wouldn't that wouldn't have happened if it was in a, a like exactly and people like I think sometimes people forget that everything like I was talking to one of my friends the other day I was saying you know what it feels like everything is actually linked whether it's so like even like kind of like stabbings in in London and 
and kind of like Grenfell and black people not getting opportunities and all of that. It's all because of the mindsets of people and and how the lack of opportunities basically leads to all these different situations. We don't have access, the same access to opportunity. And many of us, many of us, so and I've spoken to other black people who have also said the exact same thing. Many of us, our parents have basically told us that we can't just act the same way as white people, but we have to work twice as harder to basically achieve anything. So we can't expect, and and I'm sure it's also been said to women as well, where I've heard stories where women are kind of like, they've got the same qualifications, but they'd rather go with the man than go with the woman. And it's the same also with kind of like black people. So sometimes I always think to myself, flipping out, like, it's hard enough being black, right? Like being a black woman must be like 10 times harder because you have to deal with both racism and misogyny. And it's just a, it's just a whole, it's, just, it's a whole different ballpark, you know? And yeah. It's bad <laughs> sometimes. But you know what? Like I would not be anything else. Like I love being a black woman. Like it, it took me a long time. It took me, do you know what I mean? There was a time in my life where I would have, like when I was a kid and I was experiencing like, racism at school and I, and that kind of thing like you would do anything to just be the same as everyone else do you know what I mean now I just there's nothing I would I just wouldn't but it is very tough yeah I, I hear that I hear you on that because as kids you you want to be included you want to be involved you just want to be you don't want to stand out do you like you don't want to stick out and that is what I've always done is stuck the, I've stuck out so yeah, now I'm glad, like, all my experiences, everything I've experienced, I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm grateful to the people that have oppressed me in some way. In some ways, yes, I am grateful because it's like, I don't know, I saw something the other day, this is ch- so cheesy, but, like, how pressure, like, makes diamonds. I've been under, I feel like pressure has been building so, so much. And it's this... What happened? What is happening is disgusting. What happened to George Floyd is disgusting. But the anger that I've felt over the last few days has has liberated me from something. It's liberated me from fearing what white people think, and that is actually so liberating because it's hard not to. Because, like you said, your family tells you you need to do this. You need to. Your the eyes are on you. We've got, I think it's time to, you know, it's time, it's like, it's time to change that. The spotlight right now is on whiteness. And that is. I think one thing I'm worried about, right? And I think I, I may have already said it. I think I already said it actually, is that I'm just, I'm like, one, I'm really worried that nothing's going to happen. Like, and I, th- and I feel like it's going to, it's just going to, it's just going to get back to normal and then nothing's going to happen. And then maybe in a couple of years' time, another person will get killed by a police officer again. And then it'll all happen again, and then nothing will happen again. And then we, I that's I really hope that death. I don't know though, because it's like our generations, our generation is going through something unprecedented with the coronavirus. Yeah, like I mean, yeah, there's been pand- pandemics before, um, and we've dealt with shit before. But like, what what has happened in the last? What has happened this year? Coupled with Donald Trump, coupled with Boris Johnson, coupled with everything, it's just like I genuinely feel like surely we are. I part of me feels like we are at a turning point. We like you could be right, Jace. Like this could just be some whole thing. But like attitudes are not gonna. I know we've all seen. We all know that people get killed, but we've been like captive. We've all been cooped up. I think the rage that everyone is feeling, especially amongst the black community, people aren't going to just forget that. I hope so. I really hope so. I hope so. I I think in in recent times, this is the furthest we've moved in in the day of social media. Like, as Jay said, like a lot of times movements like this often just turn up being a gimmick in the sense that people just change their display pictures and then you get the standard comments of sending love and prayers and whatnot but you know it's, it's building momentum in a sense that in a way we haven't seen for for not in our generation anyways um and there's people starting to stand up so the the, uh, the fear is yes that you know we don't 
want it to just all happen for no reason. We don't want it to end in, in vain. So it's even if you look at how the at many people came out for the climate. Do you know what I mean? Like this, everyone is ready. I feel like even if you're not anti-racist, you're ready for a revolution. Like in some way, we've been getting it all wrong for like a really long time. We've been doing like so many things wrong in so many different areas of shit. Like I just don't think I'd, there's a lot of people are going to lose momentum. I think, do you think we have a plan? Because someone actually mentioned it earlier to me today where it was like, what's all these changing and just seeing Black Lives Matter going to do? Like, what actually is the plan? What's good about no, it? we don't. We, that's the thing. We, we was, you you yeah, can't plan, we though. Like, I mean, plan. this can. is all a reaction out of... You can, of course, you. but this this whole reaction is coming out of... Uh, as, as as a reaction to the events of, of what happened to George Floyd. So... No, this, is, no this, this, isn't, this isn't just about George Floyd anymore, right? You understand that? Right. Not anymore, no, no, no. And it wasn't right from the beginning. It wasn't just about that, but like it was about everything else beforehand, right? We are disorganized. We've been like, and do you know what I mean? That's exactly the my people problem. that stand up in our community, yeah. like the black activists that we've seen over the years that have stood up, have all been telling us organize. But but that is the same. I don't necessarily like. I. I'm yeah, I'm fully, I'm an extremely disorganized person, but the there, I think there are lots of reasons why we have not been able to organize because why we do you are think that? we're oppressed, we're oppressed <laughs> like every part of the system makes it difficult for us to get a leg up anywhere to get to build um wealth within our culture. Like, do you know what I mean? It so to. To become organised is a privilege. We can't be too hard on ourselves in that situation. But at the same time, my question is how, how do you how do you how do you organise something like this? You have to you have to um, put your money where you put your money means everything a lot. It means everything. It means so much you, where you put your money. I'm so gonna for you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, something that gonna... <laughs> it's something that I was saying like back when the coronavirus started going on. And it was just like, okay, we're in a situation where we're on lockdown and the only, we are literally relying on the corporations to feed us. That's so scary. Like we're relying on all of the big supermarkets for us to get our food because we're on lock. Do you know what I mean? Like we, everyone, the I mean, to have a revolution, yeah, you need to stop funding your money into the stuff that's still keeping us oppressed. So that is, you need to stop going to McDonald's. It, it's, it's that, it's, it needs to be like that. It, that's how it needs to be. And it needs to be like, um, just a complete switch in everything. Like, there is one, there, I think there's like one black-owned bookshop in London. It's in North London. Do you know what I mean? Like, every... Ev- Everyone is, there might be more than one, but like when I go, do you know what yeah. I mean? There's no, not no, 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 no. Big, This one isn't a bookshop. It's just, there's a, there's a guy. So basically when I was in London one time in Oxford, um, Oxford Street, um, there's a guy who sells kind of like black history books and I bought a book of him. Mm. Um, and so I follow him on Instagram and I just see that he basically goes either to black, um, black, uh, either Oxford Street or some other place. I can't remember where he sells these books. And so there's, there are kind of like people who do it on a lower level. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, it's like what we're doing right now. It's almost ridiculous. Like we're just like going. I'm literally shouting at my white followers, like, go and fucking buy this black book, like this book by this black woman, and they're going to fucking Amazon. It's like this is the issue. It's this is this is the bottom line. Yeah, like we need to be more organised and everyone needs to be thinking about where they're putting the money. Don't give it all to Jeff Bezos, who's just made, like, millions out of the pandemic. So it's literally, it literally goes like that, yeah. It, so, yeah, we need to be organised. Yeah, we need to be, we really do need to be organised. You need to be, there needs to be enough access for people to not keep using the, the corporations because that is where, how we're being kept powerless, yeah. So tomorrow morning, tomorrow is, oh, today's Tuesday. Oh, my God. I'm literally so, like, just I, every day is just rolled into one big day this week. Um, 
So there's a black bookshop that I'm going to call tomorrow and just find out how the fuck I'm going to get how do you know what I mean? They've been closed for months because of the coronavirus, yeah. How how it is that we can just make it happen so that all of their stock is being bought by all the pe all these white people that are starting to give a shit about racism. Give the money to that person. Like Jesus. But yeah, at the same time, like go on. Do you think that um it's not just we need to be organized. Do you think, for example, the curriculum needs to be changed? The way, oh my the way fucking god! Are, so the way kids are taught, me, me, are taught needs to be changed, and it's not just. Can I tell you a story? And I've downloaded, and I haven't read it yet because, like, so much has been going on. A study by by Nadina Do- 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 Doherty. I'm going to say. It's called I Felt Dead, Applying a Racial Microaggressions Framework to Black Students' Experiences of Black History Month and Black History. Because I'm telling you, if you're in, if you're the only black person in an all-white school and you're like eight or nine years old and they play a tape of Martin Luther King, like, oh my God, none of those kids understand it. Do you know what I mean? Black history is not taught properly at all that is a huge problem that needs to be in in year seven why was I learning about Henry VIII that means nothing it doesn't like that is not gonna why are we not learning history that actually is going to help us deal with that is uh, still affecting society today that is the history that we need to learn do you know what I mean that is the history we need to learn the history that's affecting society today and that is black history and so many other histories do you know what I mean the histories that reflect the students in your school the history that, that that reflects the people that you're going to go to work with. My point, my point, my point is so it's like not just even necessarily just about Black history, which but which I do by the way think is very important because you can't just study the history of one race and then expect everyone else to kind of like forget. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a whole like our history as a collective is based on everyone else's history, so we need to learn about. Black history. Exactly. That is so true. It's not even black history, is it? It's not black history. It's your history. <laughs> we need to learn the true history, yeah. My point is, even things like uh, music, so teaching music in school, should there be more black musicians taught in school? Should there be, when we talk about, when we study, I don't know, science, should it be more, should it, like, do you know what I mean? It's not just based on... So when like, you look in textbooks, it's just white people in the textbook. When you look in... Well, like, that's, that's, that's part of racism. Te- all the textbooks that exist in school, they're probably still using the same ones. I'm 30 now, yeah. They're probably still using the same ones in school for the kids that are 14 now, that, when I was there. The textbooks, it, it goes down to the language used in the te- it's, it's Textbooks are racist. <laughs> do you know what I mean the textbooks we're using at school are racist bottom line that is it like the, the materials and the curriculum is racist the, most of the teachers are racist <laughs> so no we, we are we are so ill equipped in this country to be dealing with this issue and it it goes it's at all levels but what I've been trying to explain to people is it starts in the home, doesn't it? It starts it starts that close to home and it starts in the schools with the teachers and Definitely, definitely. I've met some teachers that have got some like and I'm literally like, I am so devastated that you are teaching children. Teachers that don't even understand the concept of white privilege. They exist and they're everywhere. They are everywhere. Like this problem is so insidious. Racism is so insidious, and it's, it, that's that's why I'm kind of me shouting about like institutional racism for years. It's just been like trying to. It's like a fart in the fucking wind. It's like shouting down a tunnel. It's nothing. It means nothing to to people most of the time. Institutional racism. What? But like, I'm not saying the n word. Like. It goes so deep, it's ingrained into society. It's in your children's textbooks. It's um, in the misrepresentation in the media. It is everywhere. It's it's everywhere. That is why, like, the only thing that we need, the thing that we need now is we've seen with the coronavirus that health systems, like, in so many countries are not equipped to deal with a pandemic in which everyone needs help. 
we've seen in the last in in 2020 year we've basically seen that society as it stands does not work I agree. for the majority Def- definitely the society doesn't work for the majority. It works for the 1% or, what, or it just doesn't work for most people. It works for the people in power. And that is what society is created for. It's created for the people in power. It's not created for the majority. Like, and that is why we need a revolution. And that I genuinely, like, I'm not even kidding. Like, this is crazy. I can't believe I'm saying this. But I think we are on the brink of a revolution. It's funny you say that because someone actually messaged me that earlier saying that they think that america is in the is on the brink of a civil war and it is it's a, it's it oh it is though donald trump has just said he's gonna bring in the army to and he that man is a psychopath when you have someone like that in power it's so much easier for something like that for a civil war to begin if you were exactly. to have for example Obama, then they would be working their weight in order to prevent such a thing. Yeah, Obama is very right? diplomatic. Whereas with Trump, he has pretty much enabled it. He's been. This has been. This has been coming for years. This has been coming ever since. Ever since it was even an option for Donald Trump to become the president of the United States, a revolution has been, a civil war has. That is like. Do you know what I mean? A madman, a racist madman if you really think about it like you could you could see this sort of trouble trouble brewing for years oh my now God, because yes, you can. if you look literally across the globe right now there are so many fascist groups which are coming into power like obviously across brazil italy and so on yeah yeah and even over here closer to home with the brexit situation like look what won over here <laughs> similar in france italy it's just many countries have where basically the right wing group are basically getting more popular, but then people say it's not it's not happening here. But that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing. Like the problem is that what I started to realize after the whole Brexit thing, what I started to realize is that I'm siloed. I'm not talking to Tories. So if I'm not talking to Tories, I think that that I'm just I find when Brexit actually. Do you know what I mean? Like the whole. I actually was shocked. I was like, shit, this is actually happening, but. The majority voted for that. I'm just not talking to them. Yeah, that's you know true. I mean? Or I don't follow them on social media. So I'm just following all these left-wing people thinking that everyone thinks the same as me. They don't. The majority the majority of people in the US are for Trump because otherwise, how did he get there? And the majority of people were for Brexit and Boris Johnson. Otherwise, why is he there? Obviously, there's rigging that goes on and money is involved. But at the same time, the people out of it, it, it's just the majority of people are stupid. I think sometimes we are caught in our little bubbles. Like you said, um, so on Twitter, for example, when the elections were happening on Twitter, I basically thought everyone was waiting for Jeremy Corbyn. I just didn't understand. I, had, I barely saw anything because we all follow, we follow people who think like us. So we don't realise that there's a whole bunch of people who are not even on Twitter. There's a whole bunch of people who, like, you're not following. So you don't know, you don't, you don't really see the representative of what's actually happening. You're seeing what you've put, what you've basically chosen to to follow, right? So we see these. Yeah, basically, if you think of Twitter from the outside, it's all like a community within itself. So all the likes and the stuff that you see is based around the algorithm of what you tend to view. So you aren't exposed to the, all the negating opinions, and that's why we, everyone was pretty much shocked with the election results. Like you could have thought, all right, maybe Labour wouldn't have won, but a lot of people were shocked. Yeah, it was so such a huge win by yeah, um, and it's the same with Donald Trump because um, what I remember when the elections in the US were happening, I thought everyone was voting for Hillary. <laughs> so when I saw Trump winning, I said, "What's going on here?" You know, like, but because of, it's what we, it basically, it's like our side of in, in America. So basically what we like here is what we're seeing have, coming from America. So when he won as well, it's kind of like, wait, what? Do you know what I mean? It's anything that goes on in America is coming to us. We just, like, we just follow, it's just any, so, I mean, come on, we have literally just got the British version of Donald Trump and there's no, like, we shouldn't feel complacent in any way. Definitely not. I think what it shows you is that social media isn't real life. 
that's what I got from it. Yeah, what um, just because you read loads of things happening on Twitter or whatever doesn't mean that that's what is happening in the world because some of these people. So that's why I think people should also realize this is a whole different conversation, but it also means that people should realize that they shouldn't really take social media that seriously because it's not it doesn't always affect what's happening in real life. And that, do you know what I mean? Well, there's so well obviously like around the whole both of the elections there was I mean we were under such an issue of fake news such like we have such an issue of fake news and that's part of social media but like that's also it's like you've got these videos of people in America that are are filming um agent provocateurs and white people who are smashing up the buildings with black people trying to get them to stop do you know what I mean it's so important for certain things but everyone has to be so careful of of where they're getting their information. I think what we, like, what I want to know is, like, do, do other people, like, what do they think? Do you think we're on the brink of a revolution? Like, taking into consideration that everything that's been going on this year, the fact that we've got, a, like, a, an absolute lunatic dictator in the most powerful seat in our house on the planet, um, and the fact that, do you know what I mean? Like we've just been locked in. We've been act. We've been imprisoned in our own homes for the last few months. Like this, the world. This is the craziest thing. Like I think something major is going to happen. I whether it, so. I think we were always heading towards something crazy happening, only because, like what, like you just said. First of all, people have been locked up in their houses for, but also I think the general there's a feeling of the rich are getting richer. Yeah, there's something bubbling like amongst everyone where like no Yeah, if you've noticed like, people from across the world are taking notice yeah. now, you know, and, this isn't it's just not, like it, something from in the US mm, or UK. It's not just, no, it's not it's even like, just about race. Australians are standing up, like do you know what I mean? I mean obviously like the issue in Australia is revolting, but like this this is worldwide indigenous people, black people, people of colour. This is worldwide the injustice that has been going on. And don't you think it's is what white people are terrified of is that they will become that is the what the white people are scared of is that they're going to be the minority or that they're going to be the oppressed and i think and that's exactly the the issue i think they think that black people or people equality yeah, for all take something away from them but i think they think that they're going to be i think i think they don't realize that it's not even revenge that black people want or whatever it's kind of like we just want to be on the same equal playing field but I think because I mean, do you know what I think I generally think right that there's a there's a fear amongst white people that black people will want to be or want to do the same thing that they did to them, and so and obviously they know how horrific <laughs> what happened to black people. It was literally so, lynching, yeah. just the most horrific raping, pillage, like slavery for fuck's sake. I mean, actually buying and selling human beings to rape them, work your land, whip them, cut them into little pieces kind of shit. That is what they're scared of. We don't want to do that. Like, and that's, but it's almost crazy that we don't. No, I don't, it's not crazy, but they think it's crazy. They think it's, we don't think it's crazy because we can't be, we can't be bothered to, like, we just want equality for fuck's sake. We've been fighting for fucking years for just to have equality. We can't be asked to go through the mess of being oppressive towards people and actively ruining people's lives and killing people. Like, no, we don't want to do that. It's not crazy. But white people and whiteness, the institution of whiteness, can't understand that because it actually, they, it's like in the last couple of days, they, they see how disgusting it is. Maybe, but when that white man had his knee in George Floyd's neck, and we watched for nine minutes whilst he killed that man in broad daylight, the world of whiteness is just like fuck this. Do you know what I mean? Like, have you seen them um, or have you read Knots and Crosses or seen the TV show that happened with it? So, I am reading the book now because for some reason I didn't read it at school, and I've read a lot of books. For some reason I didn't read the book at school and I will not watch the TV show until I watch it. Like, I'm just, I really just don't want to. So I'm like halfway through the book. But it's, it's such a fascinating concept mm. that, yeah, just like... It's funny because, um, <laughs> so when I read, when I first read it, so I don't know, when I was, I don't know, 12, 13, whatever, however old I was when, when I read it, right? 
I remember getting so confused about, and I kept having to check which color was not and which color was crosses because to me, like whenever I, I kept thinking of the oppressed, I just kept, it can't yeah, ever be it just white. Didn't, like the fact that it was white yeah, people, exactly. I just couldn't, my brain just, just couldn't. couldn't like. Same, I'm having right? that issue. With and it. then when I finally got used to it, so then I watched the TV show and watching it, watching the show, even though I was seeing the black people as the elite, the, the privileged, it like I still. I still wasn't. I still wasn't on their side. Like I was still like, even though, even though they're the ones that who look like me, and that's like, oh yeah, this is kind of like the world. What this is how I should like it. Like just seeing the white people being oppressed, I felt more like them than I did to the black people in that situation. Because and I think it's because we're we're used to being seeing all those microaggressions, all those behavior that we just recognize or we just relate to them a lot more than we do to. Um, so. What, so for me, oh, I can see yeah. what you mean. Yeah, so what, it's like it's like you you wouldn't want it's like you don't want that to happen no, to no, anyone. I don't, no, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to make white people experience those white uh, microaggressions because genuinely, uh, part of them. Um, you're when you're having a discussion with a white person about racism, they're getting all upset, and you're just like, oh, you're just like, oh, fuck's sake, like, don't get upset, like, don't worry about. It. Do you know what I mean? Like, you feel fucking sorry for the, you feel sorry for them, and it's like, yeah, because it's empathy that you understand. <laughs> like, I don't know. To bring it back to, we're talking about history, so we, this is like basically like we want to to talk about actual change, what we want to see happen, right? So I, for example, right, talk bringing it back to schools. So when when we come to um, like history, for example, when because when you speak to a lot of a lot of white, so I've had conversations with white people where they're like, "Yeah, Great Britain, we conquered the whole world and we became the great this great empire," but then they don't realize the specifics of what of what they did, right? Right. Like, I'm from Ghana, so Brit- Ghana was a British colony, right? We were conquered by the British, so I have I I know the effects of what has happened to my country because of the British, right? So sometimes when when I've had this conversation with people and they talk so proudly about this great British empire and what's happened in the past, and I'm thinking, mate, you you really don't know that you have basically ruined generations of people's lives and you speak so proudly about it, not knowing the and people forget that this this isn't just to black people. This happened in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, you know? Hong Kong, all these places, right? And they basically have devastated people's lives. And even till now, there's still the effects of how Europeans have just ruined all these countries who were colonized. And so when I hear people speaking about it so proudly, like, oh yeah, we were the great conquerors, like, mate, you you really don't understand like how yeah, how terrible they so I think that when they when when they teach British history, they should <laughs> they should teach like the atrocities that happened in this situation like the same way i'm guessing probably in germany when they, when they teach german history they probably talk about what the nazis did and i feel like the germans really are aware of what they did to jewish exactly. people and i don't think the british and, are and like yeah. i feel like generationally like they seem to feel quite bad about it because they know and we know we also the world knows what they did as well but in when it comes to Britishness and colonization, we don't we don't know enough at all and we're not learning the right stuff. No, not at all. I think people need to realise that this isn't something that we should be proud of and like we should teach proper history, not just basically gloss it over and make it seem all glamorous because it wasn't glamorous and yeah, like that. So that for me is one change that I want to see. I want to see I want to see changes made in the curriculum and Okay, so that's the first change in the revolution. Let's let's completely disrupt the curriculum and make it's, I think like, it's like decolonise it, the curriculum that's what I think should be done yeah, yeah. 100% decolonise the curriculum what else um, that's a huge one and then also I feel like oh, dismantling capitalism is hugely important and obviously it's a big one <laughs> but dismantling capitalism is hugely important if you're gonna try, if you're gonna try and buy a book about racism, try and buy it from an independent bookstore. Better, own, better a black owned bookstore or a black owned seller. Do you think that that's the same for try a lot stop. of things? So supporting small businesses. The same for everything. Of, um, yes, it's the same for everything. 
support instead of supporting the the big the big people support the little man put the money back in the community start your own business and get your community to support you that's that's what needs to be done and then industries need to be fully disrupted like the industries are not just going to go are they like even if we do start supporting small businesses that i've had there's so many people that have got problems with diversity quotas in work oh yeah like I don't know if you've heard people just being like oh my god you know quality and diversity quotas don't work because then you just got people that are not qualified for the job it's just like I'm sorry if a person of color if someone is going for a job and they're a person of if you've got two people and they've got a Muslim name and John Smith there's a very high chance that John Smith even if the qualifications are exactly the same they're going to choose John Smith because institutional racism and unconscious bias and bigotry so yeah industries need to have an equal amount of people of color do you know what i mean opportunities need to be given to people of color do you think okay so i had a conversation with someone i have a lot of conversations by the way as you probably gathered because but a while ago one of my good friends so we always have these kind of talks right so we're discussing right is it is it um equality in terms of so is it equality of results or is it equality of opportunities? I don't know if I'm expecting if I asked the question right, but basically what I'm trying to say is instead of so instead of there have there been diversity quotas or we want to get this many people in the in this blah blah blah, it should be creating opportunities for people at a younger age. Well, yeah, able. but it's, that's yeah, hundred percent. But the problem is is there isn't. But that's what needs to be addressed in my in my opinion. Like it's not it's not about giving the the a small percentage of people who manage to make it through that system to then give them it's about making sure everyone no matter your background no matter i mean no matter your race no matter where where you live or whatever gets that opportunity to be able to make something of yourself and like so for example i remember so i said this to someone right so i remember one time someone asked me oh what you so what are you doing now and i was like oh yeah i'm a scientist blah, blah, blah. he was like whoa i've never i've never I've, i don't even know one single black scientist and to me, that kind of shows that people don't people don't see these kind of jobs or these these kind of roles as something that is for them, because they don't, there isn't enough representation in those kind of roles. But what is a diversity equality? A, a diversity quota is an opportunity. It's it's making it's opening the door because if a comp a lot of companies, yeah, if they're saying you don't need, you need to make sure you at least employ this amount of people of color, then they probably won't. So that is, it's an opportunity. No, I get your point. Yeah, you know I think I mean? you're right. It, it's like, it's, I think they are important, personally. How, how do you prove that it's been, in, in, it's been improving, like something like that? Like it's been... Well, there's so many studies that say when you have a more diverse um, workforce, you have more innovative ideas. Like there's so many studies on how, on the benefits. There's the benefits of diversity quite as way outweigh any kind of negative side, like side of things, apart from like white people will get upset. That is it. Do you know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, if you've got someone who is a minority and someone who is white and you've got both CVs and they're exactly the same, my cousin, who is white, actually explained, like, said this to me, like, when I was, like, really frustrated about a situation at work. He was like, the person of colour, you should always look at them as a better candidate to, so to, get, to get into the same position as that white person with all the same stuff. They've had to fight harder. So they are going to be a better employee. Do you know what I mean? Like thinking about things in like people don't think about it that way, though, do they? You need people to think like that. Think, think about it. Think about what to to be to be even considered to be in one of those white spaces as a person of color. You have had to ha you've had a fight, and that should be recognised. No, I think I, I, I get I get the point you're trying to make actually. So. As we start to wrap up then, like, where do we see this going? Where do we want to see it going? We don't know. I want a revolution. That's what I want. And what does a revolution entail for you? For me, like, I think for years we've been using, throwing around the word woke, haven't we? <laughs> but it's like I feel like for a lot of people, but not enough, obviously, but for a lot, more than there has been for a very, very long time, perhaps since the civil rights movement, a veil has been lifted. And it's like people are starting to wake up. And um, 
a revolution to me looks like deconstruction of society. It looks like a lot of hard work on everyone's behalf. Deconstruction and reconstruction of society. You know, like, it's hard to get a society right, but we've definitely not got it right right now. I mean, if you look at, like, I mean, you know, if you look at the fact that most of the world leaders and most of the CEOs are men, like, if you, and in the last few months, we've seen that the countries that have done the best out of the coronavirus are the ones that are led by women. I, I personally think women are better leaders, by the way. So, yeah. I do too. Thank you. Um, so do I. I think so too. But the, but when like, ten years ago we weren't saying that. We've gone through like the Me Too movement and so many other different things and different waves of feminism. And now everyone's trying to wake everyone up to the to the fact that everything's been whitewashed and that there's a, there's a really there's a plague in society and that's racism. And that's one of the first things that needs to be deconstructed and reconstructed when we break down society. The distribution of wealth, all these all of these things. I mean, Jesus Christ, I just hope there's I hope we're on the brink of a revolution. And if and we need to be pushing for it. That's what we need to be doing. That's what everyone needs to be doing right now is pushing for a revolution, pushing for everything to change, pushing for the future and pushing for our kids' future. Because it doesn't look good right now in a racist, patriarchal society where our health systems are not equipped to deal with global pandemics and there's going to be more of them because we're... I mean, come on, like, with dictators, like, I mean, Trump, one word, like... We've mentioned Trump a lot, you know. I know, but he's just... He's a monster, isn't he? And, like, that's... Things in America, like, wouldn't be like that if Obama was still here. (laughs) I don't think, like... Jason, what what do you think? For me, I think that education is key in everything. I think a lot of people are oblivious to what's going on and it needs to be basically so obvious to them that there's nothing you can say about it. Kids need to be taught from a young age. It's not about, so it's not about basically teaching white kids to grow up and to be feeling all bad or or blah, blah, blah. It's basically just like, um, just teach them the real history and everyone can grow up and just like, and just learn to and learn of what's happened in the past and just learn how we, and then try and be better. And because I think if you speak to that, to, um, to a German or something who's learned about Nazi, like they, ever, they don't ever want to go back to that dark history. So if we educate people at such a young age that when we get so going forward, we don't ever want to return to this history again. And we can kind of like focus on trying to create a better future and a better environment for everyone included. I, I think that's, the right way to go and by educating people people don't grow up having these thoughts because i think like i was like there's that cheesy quote about no one's born racist and all that kind of stuff obviously that's true because if you put a black child next to an asian child next to a white child and you put them in the same place they're going to play together do you know what i mean so no one's born racist so people are taught racism and the fact that people are taught racism means that they can also be taught to not be racist you know i mean that, yeah so that's that's just what i think to be honest with you and I think it's like it's. I think it's anyone who does feel like they've equipped themselves with a little bit of knowledge lately is to have conversations with people. So it's like, yeah, one hundred percent education system needs to be upturned, but education starts at home. To, but it does. Like you start if your parents know how to. to do you know what I mean? Like if your parents were well educated about this stuff, the chances of your kid being. But that's what that's what I mean. So that education starts that. somewhere. So for some people who like there's some people who aren't racist but their parents or their grandparents are racist because they've learned different yeah so it has to start from somewhere exactly so it needs to start from somewhere so that then those people can then teach their kids as well you know so yeah yeah that's what i mean for sure and it does obviously it needs to be in the education system as well like it's just it's everywhere that's the whole problem of white supremacy it's systemic it's in every system <laughs> On that note, so I, I totally agree with what you said f- at first, Kez, like, as in like uh, rebuilding from top to bottom, bomb from top. I think in terms of what we get out of all this, the, the movement at the current moment is the fact that first and foremost, like complete justice justice is necessary, as in the fact that the reason why everyone started this is because they want those four policemen that were involved in the situation to be charged. So they cannot be they need to go to prison that's the rules that they set out yeah 
yeah so that's what's necessary at, at, at first and foremost and then you're looking for reform in the police the way everything is dealt with the policing in in America that's what I know this next. has been a very long conversation but th- did I mention was it when we were talking the other day but like my friends just become a police officer and I asked her have you done any unconscious bias training or um sociology training or do you know what I mean like around systemic racism and the historic racism of the police force and she was like no and I was like that's terrifying I'm terrified now exactly so there's a lot of things that's been overlooked so yeah that that's what I think so I think in terms of looking at what needs to come out of this whole movement the first thing is that the initial reasons for it need to be tackled and achieved and then you have to look beyond that and literally build from top to bottom bottom from top so that that's what I feel revolution is necessary from everything yeah yeah but we yeah we don't know where it's gonna head but the most important thing is education for each and every person so Kez what would you recommend that yeah people go 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 do now I would recommend that you challenge if you are feeling if you are are a white person and you are feeling in any way attacked or you're feeling any weird feelings you need to challenge those feelings do you know what I mean? Why is that? Then obviously you need to read, read, read. Because I've read so many books on race and racism and books by black authors that have helped me. And it's not because I need to understand racism because I fully understand racism because I've experienced it. It's it's to give me the information and language to be able to explain it to white people. <laughs> Um, so if, if a white person was to go and read these books, that would take a huge burden off the black community. So go and educate yourselves. And should, should I read out some books or, um, so definitely read why I'm no longer talking to white people by, um, about race by Rennie Edel Lodge. That should be. That should be number one on your list, in my opinion. Then I would go for um, Akala Natives. Um, another great example, exactly. And also British. Um, God, there's so many. Um, for a woman, I would say, for women, Slay in Your Lane um, is a good one. Then um, I think you mentioned it yesterday, Jace, Americana for for like a fiction for a fictional perspective, which is like genuinely like I've learned so much from fiction books. Like don't sleep on that situation. Do you know what I mean? I've actually recommended that book um, in, the, in one of our previous podcasts, but that actually fits in perfectly in this episode as well. Um anything by Andrea Levy, James Baldwin, um Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. Very interesting that book because that was the first time I kind of really understood the situation in South Africa and how, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, anything by Zadie Smith, Their Eyes Are Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Um, yeah, we'll definitely have a reading list. You can add, yeah, 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 that's all. Yeah, we'll, we'll make a list with some of the suggestions, well, with all the suggestions. So another thing then, like for people who might not prefer to read, is there any other platforms or mediums that you yeah, can Yeah, if you want to follow some people, follow Rachel Cargill, Erica Hart, Munro Bergdorf, um, Akala as well. Uh, God, there's so many people. But yeah, I can put a list together of those people as well. Um, then there are some... Even like, I feel like it's important to mention some white women to follow. If, because, like, genuinely, it seems that when a white person says something, white people listen more. So, some good white women to follow at the moment Florence Given. She's, um, she's, yeah, I'm appreciating her right now. Um, someone called Das Penman. She made a lot of the really cool, um, graphics that I've been sharing that kind of de- deconstruct what it is to be an ally and like um, non-performative racism and blah blah blah. Um, I'm following a very cool um, therapist, um, POC therapist. Uh, I'm Sia Root. I'll put her um, tag in there as well. She's posting some very shareable 
contacts yeah, yeah so there's there's loads of people you can educate if you don't fancy read it and then there's movies like like anything Ava Devani the 13th where you learn that slavery actually wasn't abolished in the US it's just the prison system <laughs> yeah I mean it's like slavery's like it, it's once you really like obviously for for Brit- for us being British it's very important to read like um black British authors like Zadie Smith and Akala and Rennie Edo Lodge but when you actually start learning about how fucked America is people need to know that people need to know that slavery hasn't been like people need to know about the prison system in the US like that is hugely important um watch Dear White People as well that's on Netflix um and the TV show watch go and watch some go and find some like I'm not asking you to go and watch like loads of Tyler Perry movies go and watch some media that's created by black people like Issa Rae Insecure to get a different perspective. Do you know what I mean? You're not just watching the same stuff made by the same people that are given the same opportunities. Um, so, yeah, follow It's the Ray. Amanda Seals is also such a boss. Um, she's got a fantastic podcast called Small Doses. Um, yeah, she deconstructs a lot of race stuff. Um, if you don't know who Amanda Seals was, she's the one who, um, as she puts it, gathered Caitlyn Jenner up like a ponytail um, and, like, gave it to her if you saw that video. So, yeah, there's there's lots of... Uh, yeah, I'll put this list together. It's going to be great. <laughs> well, I guess we have a lot of resources for people. <laughs> so many resources. And it's like, I've been doing this work, like, and it's 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 like, yeah, it's, it's white people that need to do the work now. So please do go and look at these resources. So yeah, no. On 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 that note, I I I've, there's so much to talk about on this topic that we're definitely going to cover it for more episodes. We'll we'll keep this uh, situ this whole topic updated every week. Jace, should we plug the socials? Thank you for listening to episode again, people. You can find us on Instagram at canvas dot of dot life underscore on Twitter canvas of life one Facebook canvas of life and on our website canvas hyphen of hyphen life dot com. And Kay, do you want to plug your socials if you want followers or? Yeah, I think we should. I think it's important. Like, I think we're all trying. We're all ready to be using our voices now. So, um, my um Instagram is at Kezia K E Z I A Leah L E A H. You can find me there. Cool, cool. Of course, we usually wrap up with our usual slogan. We haven't talked much about the coronavirus, but yeah, like we said, this is an episode which needed to be dedicated to to one topic and one topic alone. So, but anyways, as we wrap up, Jace, far away. As always, people, but you can't say stay home anymore, right? And it's not stay alert. Basically, <laughs> basically just, just, I don't even know what the rules are anymore. So basically, just, just keep staying alert. Just keep just alert. stay alert, I guess. Okay, so on to them, people. Stay blessed, stay safe, and see you soon. Goodbye. It's been a pleasure. Till next time. Bye.